please welcome to a teaching called A Shift is Here. A Shift is Here. Now, my dear friends, we are living in the end days. Whether you believe it or not, yes, we are. We are living in the end days where the power of God's hands is vividly and amazingly demonstrated with awesome results, especially in the lives of those who are experiencing revival and kingdom revelation. Let me tell you this. This may sound like something that is news to you, but I want you to know something. The Holy Spirit has been telling me that we are living in the midst of the last day's revival. It is happening in the inside of each one of us. God is moving in your life and he's doing something fantastic, something that may not be so tangible, something that may not that you may not be able to feel or hear or understand properly. But if you have discernment from the anointing of the Holy Spirit that is in you, you would know that this is the absolute truth, that there is a change, a transformation that is happening in the inside of you. Can I have an amen? Amen? amen. Maybe you don't recognize it so much, you don't realize it, but it is happening. It is like still waters. You may look at the still water and you may think, nothing is happening here. But if you dipped a finger into that stream or that body of water, you will know that there is a power in. There is something happening. There is something happening. And it is happening in the inside of you right now. Believe me, I am so confident in telling you this because I can feel it in the inside of me. I felt it in the lives of those who are working with us in this ministry, the staff, the team members. And I want to tell you this, it is happening in each one of you. There is revival. There is kingdom revelation. Amen. Now, these are highly volatile seasons in the spiritual timeline as God will begin to fulfill his prophetic release and nothing can stop him. You see, he is God. And as God, he knows what he's doing and he will not allow any force, any factor to come in and disturb his progress in what he is doing. In fact, Habakkuk, Chapter 2, verse 3, you have these words. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Amen. Can you say this with me? It will not be delayed. There are many changes that will occur, some gradual, but many spontaneous, where authentic believers are shifting their perspective and paradigm for God's heart and mind in ways never seen before. There are a few changes and a few transformations that are happening in the lives of many believers, not only in the West, or in certain places of revival, not only just in mega churches, not only in the lives of great prophets and apostles and evangelists, but it is happening here and everywhere. These few changes and transformations are really fantastic if only you will keep still and notice them. Some you may have noticed in your own life, some you may have noticed in the life of your leaders, of your fellow believers, or of believers in other churches as well. If you see this, be encouraged and seek for the more. I have a few points to share with you this afternoon. So what are these changes? Number one, 
Hungry believers are realizing it has never been about their performance or ability, but when they rest on Christ's finished work, prophecies are revealed upon them daily. Yes, this is true. Prophecies are happening in your life, my dear friends, every single day. Just look at the weather and the way that it seems to become really sporadic. Too much rain, too much heat, too much cold, too much drought. It's all here. Prophecies are happening. Look at the, the controversies and the conflicts and the, the, the struggle and the wars that are happening in many parts of the world. You know what? It has already been prophesied here. So prophecies are revealed upon us daily. Look at that. Prophecies are revealed upon them daily. When you humble yourself for what the Lord will do in and through you, you begin to have a blast living your mandate beyond what you can ask or imagine. Right from the word go, Passionate God lovers like um, Joseph, David, and all the apostles, they began their love journey with not much qualifications, but with a whole load of trusting and obeying. While they went through the dungeon, while they went through the barren wilderness and the persecution experiences, but God helped and vindicated them so they could develop spiritual muscles and divine wisdom. Number two, radical believers are awakening to the realization that God really did create every person with a unique destiny and assignment in mind. God already has plans, purposes, and promises kept in place as he leads them with his own hand, guiding, teaching, and even pushing them at times. You know what? Every time when I see a problem come against me and against the ministry, I always understood this, that whatever has happened, it may have taken me by surprise. It may have taken our leaders by surprise. It may have taken the professionals who are with us by surprise, but it has not taken my father by surprise. Amen. We didn't expect that power outage just now. But you see, it was not a surprise for our father. And you need to trust him. You need to believe in what he can do. Believe in him. Engage in his plans and in his purpose for you. Now listen to this. As they yield themselves to him and his awesome will and way, they began to see a pattern unfolding that makes them fruitful despite every hurdle or drawback. Truly they understood Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let me say this. Jesus, Joseph could have exacted retributions from his brothers for, the, for their evil against him. He could have Ask for revenge because of the injustice that they meted out against him. Imagine their own flesh and blood and they sold him, their younger brother, for slavery. Why? Because they were jealous, they were envious, they were angry, they were offended with him and his dreams. So jo Joseph could have said, I want retribution. I want them to pay. And no one would hold it against him. David could have easily plotted against King Saul because of the injustice that he suffered. And besides, he was already anointed to be king in his place. Paul could have used his clout and connection 
as a Roman citizen to escape persecution. But passionate lovers of God consider their sacrifice as part of their love living. My dear friends, let me just say this. When you know who love you, the lover of your soul, you will live your life as the beloved. Too many of us spending time living as orphans, as ditched girlfriends or boyfriends, as divorcees, as uh, orphans, as poor, as neglected, dejected, disappointed, frustrated. I lost my father when I was very, very young. I lost my mom in 1998. I have no brother, no sister. But I want you to know this, that through all of that time, God was with me. He's my real father. And his love for me is authentic. And when I understood that after having been born again, I started the living as his beloved. You do that. See what happened. Wake up every morning and say, I'm loved by my father. Before you would take your toothbrush and your toothpaste, say, I'm loved. Look at yourself in the mirror. You may have a small bathroom mirror, or maybe you have no mirror. Go look at your image elsewhere and just say, I am God's beloved. Can we say that now? I am God's beloved. In the name of Jesus, I am loved. Amen. Number three. True believers are now realizing that the stress of being controlled and manipulated is just not worth the mental, spiritual, and physical health risks anymore. They are discovering that God's plan for us was never to dwell in a place where chains could be heard rattling and backs are pushed to breaking. An ancient man of faith felt the tug of God's leading to leave his place of burden it was Jacob. He had served his father-in-law, Laban, for 20 long years through thick and thin until his family grew in numbers and also in prosperity. Then the Lord told Jacob in Genesis chapter 31 verse 3, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives and I will be with you. I will be with you. Go back. You can never be fruitful. You can never be forceful or faithful in a place where you're simply tolerated and where your worth is never appreciated. God never intended for you to stay on in your wilderness experience. Soon there will come a time when you will have to cross the Jordan and enter the place of your promise, the place of your inheritance, the place of your holy substance. You have a possession, an inheritance, a substance that God has promised each one of you. Some of you, you're so focused on the negative. You're so focused on the loss. You're so focused on the difficulties and the problems. My dear friends, stop focusing on the sound of the rain. Start focusing on, wow, I'm not wet. I'm not drenched. I'm not cold. Amen? See the good in spite of the bad. Have your father's eyes who sees good where there seems to be no good at all. Amen. Number four. Lovers of God have awakened to the presence of a God who not only loves them, but actually likes them and enjoys hanging out with them, regardless of what they think about themselves. Look at this beautiful picture here. I'm so glad I got this picture from the internet. It speaks so much about my spiritual journey. I got my bags packed. I got my traveling clothes on. 
And every time when I have to wait for the car or wait for the transport or wait for the plane or wait for the train or whatever, I have this strong feeling, this discernment that I'm not traveling alone, that Jesus is with me, that I'm not anywhere alone, that I'm not by myself. Jesus is with me. Now, there are some of you who may say, oh, Pastor Lam, for you, it's okay, but what about me? I don't feel good about myself. I don't feel right to even think that Jesus would be traveling or sitting with me. Well, let me just tell you this. Peter may not have, be, may not have a big fan following, nor did he like himself that much after he denied the Lord. But the Lord had him in his mind, okay? The whole time when he was at the cross and in the grave. So when he came back to life, the angel said in Mark chapter 16 verse 7, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Peter is on the list of those whom Jesus wanted to meet because the Lord had already done it for him. And when they got to Galilee, it wasn't Peter who initiated the restoration by confessing his sins or begging for Jesus' forgiveness. No. The Bible tells us that it was the Lord Jesus himself who restored Peter by asking him about his love for him. Not once, not only twice, but three times. Perhaps to convince Peter that his denial of him three times, thrice, has been met with redemption three times over to. Amen? Do you enjoy that? That's the Lord for you. That's Jesus for you and me. He knows what we've gone through. He knows the guilt that we carry. And he's here to lighten the load and tell you, you're mine. Number five, committed believers are now rejoicing because of the revelation that God has always been cheering them on when it comes to living an abundant life and walking out their dreams. They are awakened to the colorless kingdom of God, where there is no prejudice against them, regardless of who they are or where they come from, as long as they pursue their Lord and King. Let me tell you this, there is no racism or shaming of any condition, whether you're fat or lean, whether you're bald, or full of hair, whether you are educated, savant, a scholar, a PhD, or an illiterate, uneducated, the people look down. There is no shaming of any condition or drawbacks in the kingdom. Why? Because God vindicates, improves, and redefines lives as precious souls surrender to him by faith. Once you experience agape love, your old ways of living, they will lose their appeal. And you will become enthralled with all that is heavenly and pure. Amen? God's love is the power that transforms even how you look and relate with others around you. Let me read for you 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Love has realigned your outlook to a level you never thought possible before. Please, people, remember this. You should be living as God's lovers, as those who have been accepted in the beloved. Remember, 
twice when Jesus, uh, when God made his voice to be heard over the event that was transpiring over Jesus, once at his baptism and another time at his transfiguration. What did God do at the very start? He identified who this carpenter from Nazareth is. This 30 plus man, this Jewish man from the tribe of Judah, who is he? He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, if you've received Jesus Christ in your life, if you haven't, don't walk out of this service. I'll give you an opportunity for you to receive Jesus in your heart. You know what's going to happen? As you receive Jesus in your heart, God, when he looks at you, he looks at you as being part of Jesus. You are accepted in the beloved. You are loved. Not just as a stranger or some poor orphan, some buddy that they pick up from the road and they'll give you the smallest room in the house and the used cloth of the elder daughter or the elder son and they'll make you eat by yourself away from the dining table and they'll allow you to do a few odds and ends things. No. To them who believe, he gave them the right to be called children of God. I'm speaking to bona fide, confirmed, accepted, and loved children of the living God. Don't doubt that. Hey, don't doubt that. Don't ever forget that also. When, let's say tomorrow or day after, or the next week, or the next month, when people, when something bad happens to you, there's a shift in your situation. You're going through something that is not right, or you've, you've done something that you feel ashamed, that you feel embarrassed, that you feel guilty, that you feel sin-infested. Even then, you're still accepted in the beloved. Why? The blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord cleanses us from all sins. That's a gerund. Cleanses. It didn't say cleansed once. It used the word cleanses. Present, continuous, tense. We learned that in English grammar. That means it's a continuing process. Amen? In fact, people of God are beginning to understand the danger and the sadness of a life lived in segregation or bias, separated from one another because of certain perceived differences or distinctions. Lately, they are taking action to erase the lines that divide and choose instead to focus on the one who saves us. True believers of Jesus no longer say, Oh, I come from this denomination. Oh, I am registered to this particular church. Oh, I have been mentored by this pastor or by that pastor. Oh, your identity is established in Jesus. That's it. Are you a Christian? They asked me one time. I said, yes, I am. What Christian? I said, I am in Christ. That's it. They said, no, we want to know whether you are this or that. I said, that's not important. I am in Christ. That's it. When you go to heaven, your denomination is not going to help you. Your bias is not going to help you. Your theology is not going to save you. No matter how much you believe in that, it's not going to help you. It's trusting in Jesus is going to get you across. Amen? Focus on the one who saved us. But you see, now we've learned to accommodate and agree to disagree with each other rather than stay aloof 
based on doctrinal stance that leads people to become aggressive, offended, and isolated. We don't need that anymore. We now live in 2024. We're living in the end times. How do you know when you reach the new heaven and the new earth, there will not be people from that denomination? Of course there will be. How do you know? I don't know. But if the thief and the cross can be in the new heaven and the new earth, there's no guarantee who will be there. All kinds. Amen? So you know what? When we reach the new heaven and the new earth, it's going to be so interesting. It will take a whole lot of eternity for us to be able to get used to each other. So let's start from now. Amen? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20 to 22, to the Jews, I became like a Jew. To win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. Amen. Besides helping us to witness, to draw others into the kingdom of God. People, please, let us just be united in the bond of love that Christ called us into. He didn't just die for the charismatics or the independent or the Presbyterians or the Protestants or the charismatics or the Roman Catholics or the Greek Orthodox. He died for all of the world. He rose from the grave for all of the world, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I checked the dictionary recently. Whosoever is still the same meaning. Whosoever, anyone. Amen. Number six. Christ's followers are realizing that signs, wonders, and miracles are not the evidence of God's approval or acceptance, but they are a byproduct of being loved in faith. Truly, Jesus is equipping and commissioning many as fishers of men in an ocean where souls winning is no longer a religious effort, but a miraculous reality all the way. Hungry lovers of God, now understand that the finished work of the cross means they do not have to suffer anymore under a fear-based theology. They no longer have to lose sleep trying to keep up and maintain a balanced account of how much they can contribute and uh, how fast they can be fruitful. Their freedom from fear captivity is simply because the Spirit of the Lord who liberates is truly enthroned hallelujah, in each of their hearts, routing out doubts, distress, and dread. Amen. First John chapter 4, verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. There is a deep conviction that is dawning among true believers that God is dealing with them as his own beloved children. As such, they do have rights and privileges at their disposal for heaven to respond with breakthroughs and turnarounds whenever they ask, seek, and knock. Jesus' lovers are quickly settling into a mindset that was once dominated by a mentality of continual suffering to one of jubilant relief because God is relentlessly pursuing to lavish each one of us with his love rather than badgering us over our failures. Number seven, believers who love to follow a prayer life of self-effort have realized that all of their shouting and weeping has not been necessary when it comes to intercession, why? Because the great intercessor himself stands to advocate 
for each of their needs and issues. Woo. Hebrew chapter 7 verse 25 says, Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to him through, who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus lives to intercede for us. Amen. Intercessors, prayer warriors, they have been looking much more healthier now. And they're more at peace. Because they are no longer praying in their own strength to make something happen. They are now praying in the name of Jesus, under the anointing of Jesus, and they've seen miracles happen. You could be one of those. These modern days, Hannah, Daniel, Paul and Silas, understand that it is not the intensity of religion, but rather the intimacy of relationship with our intercessor that will always move mountains, split seas, calm storms, and rain down fire. Healing, deliverance, and abundance are just as spirits grown away. Remember Romans chapter 8, verse 26, which says, We do not know how to pray, but the Holy Spirit takes our prayers and makes them to become unutterable groans, acceptable to God. Wonderful. I, 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 I relate this story many times. I just want to say it once again. There was one time when I was told to go to the ICU to go and pray over somebody who used to worship at us. And so I went to this hospital, entered into the ICU, and I met with this lady. And she was being treated with oxygen and uh, the oxygen nozzle on her face. Uh, she, she had pipes. She had um, um, IVs going in, coming out. She looks very, very sick. So I walked right up to her and she was like, she couldn't even speak. But then somehow when she saw me, she said, I can't even pray. And I said, can you groan? And she said, yes said, good, that's the best prayer. Keep on groaning. Keep on groaning. God's going to help you. And sure enough, after a few days, she was shifted to the ward. And then she left the hospital and was well again. Why? Authentic prayers are groans. Groanings in the Holy Spirit. Maybe your words are not articulate enough for the ears of men, but your groans are fantastic sound of, that requires the Father, calling on the Father, and he responds. So every time you find yourself in the dilemma, groan away. Amen. Number eight, children of the Most High are smiling much more now after they learned to reject the religious mindset that has been telling them they have to look and act serious all the time to be spiritual. They have that church going face. From Monday to Saturday, they have a different face. It's a face you like to talk. Hi, long time to see you. How are you? And they're like, hi, man, how are you? Except on Sunday, you're like, mm. <laughs> hello. Mm. Oh, my God. Good morning. Mm. Oh, my God. <laughs> Why? Somehow the religious mindset thing that you must be so serious, you must be solemn, you must be unsmiling. <laughs> Imagine people coming to church and the Holy Spirit says, what happened? What's wrong with you? This is my church going face. <laughs> when they lose themselves in having childlike fun, that's the word, fun. They have discovered that those things they were so concerned about have been worked out without their help. Listen, Martha was huffing and puffing to get things done, while all along, Mary was enjoying the king and his kingdom just by hanging near his feet. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. 
Entering hell demands that you must plan, implement all kinds of scheming and conniving, stealing, hurting, corrupting, abusing, fighting, and even killing. But entering heaven requires you to just believe and receive. Did you know that? It's so easy to go to heaven. Just trust and obey. Just have faith. So learn to stop worrying and start enjoying your father's love and affection. Number nine. Kingdoms, citizens everywhere have awakened to the truth. They no longer have to be poor to be spiritual. The light bulb of revelation has turned on brightly in their spirit, realizing that Christ died so they could have it all, including prosperity to be a blessing to others. The king and his kingdom are not about a poverty mindset, nor about raising orphans and paupers. Rather, it is about uplifting the poor, the weak, and the least so they can have a lifestyle that is on earth as it is in heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. They have come to understand that people like Job, Abraham, Solomon, Joseph of Arimathea, they were rich, yet God takes no issue with having wealth when it is held with a loose grip. Freely you have received. Freely give. But how can you give if you have not received? First receive, then you can give. Amen? That way, they could easily bless the needy and advance the gospel with the generosity of their Father in heaven. Number 10, lovers of Jesus have been realizing that institutional Christianity has been wrapped in man-made borders with limited freedom within its ranks, causing them to search for the wide open spaces of their father's love. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 to 18, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. They have chosen relationship over red tape. And in doing so, their spirit has been filled with contentment, peace, and love for their brethren who have not yet made the journey beyond the barbed wire of limited religiosity. Saul of Tarsus was trying to win the favor of God and man through petty religious dogmas until he encountered the risen Christ on the way to Damascus. And then he understood that winning souls into God's kingdom is never through hatred, arrogance, a judgmental condemnation, but through love, liberty, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we try too much to please God, religious leaders, and religious dogmas. When the road to heaven is not you trying, but you trusting. Number 11, Christ-conscious believers are discovering that focusing on sin and punishment has done little to break open the great potential of human ability and resources for improving this world as we know it. They are finding out that their focus on who is wrong and right can never change the impact and the impetus of what Christ is doing in and through us. Romans chapter 8 verse 1, favorite verse, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus saw himself as a bystander from the outside, looking in, because he believed that he was not good enough to have an up-close and personal moment with Jesus. But the Bible tells us what? 
the Lord walked right into his life and straight into his home, radiating salvation that made him to shift his love and allegiance from money to Jesus. Amen. Many carry such testimony from the Samaritan woman, the thief on the cross, to the Apostle Paul, and hundreds of thousands in this day and age. Jesus' arms, let me tell you, they are still open to draw anyone closer to himself, despite our failures, our weaknesses, and our histories. Amen? Finally, number 12. Children of God are now coming to the realization that when it's all said and done, there is nothing more satisfying than knowing just how patiently forgiving is our Father, whose love will never falter, even after we have strayed and been rebellious. The prodigal son thought he could apply for the post of a servant, but his dad was waiting for him to come back home as the son. A prodigal son, but still a son. Any one of you may feel here that you have become worse than the prodigal son? Don't worry. Dad still looks down at you and he says, that one is still mine. Amen. John chapter 1 verse 12 to 13. Yet to all who received him, I want to put this in my heart, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but, come on, say with me, born of God. Look at yourself right now and just touch your heart and say, I am born of God. One more time. I am born of God. Amen. The moment that we recognize and repent of our sins, accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, and surrender ourselves to the renewing and restoring power of the Holy Spirit, we are born again to start a new and a victorious life that will extend from here through all of eternity. We don't have to remain stagnated in the mire of negativity, dread, hopelessness, and condemnation of our past. God is still our Father whose plan of saving us is still operational. It is still effective. It is still powerful. Listen, David, Peter, Paul, and countless others experienced this awesome grace and they were saved by the forgiving arms of a God who could wash their sins and transform them. Why? Because he paid their debts with his own blood and his own life. May we discover that living loved is worth more than all of the fleeting wealth and pleasures of the world. And because God's love is cheering us on, the sky is the limit when it comes to going after our dreams. Besides, they're not just our dreams, my friend, since Papa God himself is dreaming them with and for us. Did you know that? You woke up this morning and you said, ah, what was that dream last night? Don't you worry. Your dreams may be carnal, may be in the flesh, but the dreams that your father has for you, and he has for me, they are dreams that will come true. Amen. Listen to this. Look at the book. Look at this Bible. Job, at the far end of his story, he saw double restoration of all he had lost. Noah landed on solid ground again and saw God's very hands that kept them safe in the ark, starting to rebuild the earth again. Abraham laughed with joy to worship a God who kept his promise through thick and thin. Moses, he saw the promised land from afar, but knew that one day this God would meet with him right in the promised land at transfiguration. Joshua and Caleb lived the dream of relocating to the promised land 
of abundance and plenty, which made all the traveling and all the wars more than worth it. Samuel knew while anointing two different men as kings of Israel, that God would eventually bring his kingdom here on earth. And there were even more dreamers with God, like David, Elijah, Elisha, Hezekiah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, Esther, and Nehemiah, who knew what it meant to live the dreams of God. Flipping the pages of the Bible to the New Testament, you will come across Joseph and Mary, Lazarus and his sisters, Jairus, Bartimaeus, the, all of the apostles, all of the deacons, all of the elders. And then you have people like Lydia, Dorcas, Apollos, and millions of unnamed saints. Church history teaches us about Ignatius, Polycarp, Augustine, and Clement. Through the centuries, we learn of those who went through the fire of persecution, losing their homes, their incomes, their loved ones, and even their lives. And during these few centuries, we saw people, we've read about God's general, Amy Semples McPherson, Catherine Coleman, and then you have Dr. Billy Graham. And then you have Reinhard Bonke. You have Don Gossett and so many. Those who have left, Miles Monroe, Steve Hill and others, they've gone on ahead. And then you have those who are still with us. People who are still releasing the word of God with authority, with power, with joy, with grace, with love, with compassion. There's a shift. We live in a generation where there are more prophets, apostles, evangelists, and leaders, not only in the West, but now in the East as well. I've just been talking to a very good friend, Mel Tari, who's just been traveling the world over and over and over again. Just last week, he was preaching to 1,000 pastors only. Pastors, leaders, missionaries in Venezuela. And then as soon as he returned back, such a great man of God. We've heard of Meltari, right? He's the guy who walked in the Pacific Ocean in Indonesia when he received Jesus Christ. And they thought they were walking through a bridge. But they, when they reached the other side, the next morning people said, how did you come here? And they said, we walked from the bridge. He said, but there was no bridge. The bridge got washed away many days back. They were walking on the Pacific Ocean. And then they realized that they were worshiping a God who walks on the storm. So anyway, he was just saying, when he returned back, he said, thank you so much. What a humble man. Thank you so much, my dear brother, for your prayer support. It is people like you who strengthen and encourage us so that we can go further. Wow. I look at these people, you know, I look at their lives. Some of them, we've brought them to our ministry. Some are coming, some we may not meet with them. But I believe that when we reach heaven, we will meet with each one of them. And you will realize that you were also loved, that you were also anointed, you were also empowered, and you were also given opportunities to be as useful and as fruitful as them. Different levels, of course. Different revelation. Different anointing. But still, serving in the kingdom and serving the king. So, many have lost. They've lost so much. But God remained faithful and strong to keep their faith and draw them into a kingdom that knows no end. You can be sure that we're worshiping this God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So right now, come and let this mighty holy shift of God take you to the next level of elevation. Because what our Father has done for others, He will surely do for us. We just need to believe and receive.
Let's pray. Hallelujah. Este kena barasun to kuraba yeshama seke. Nel ne me yeshama su kuraba sun doraye. Hallelujah, Jesus. We bless you, we worship you, we exalt your holy name. I thank you from the depths of my heart for all of the wonderful things that you continue to do in and through each one of us. I bless your heart, loving Jesus. I thank you because you are awesome and you are mighty. You are right here with us, loving us, taking hold of us, and enabling us to be yours. Oh, we glorify you. I glorify you. I thank you because you have brought all of these your people here. Because you love them. Because you like them. Because when you look at them, each of us, we matter to you. Why? We are your kids. Why? We are your children. Right now, I bring these people closer to you. I bring them into a place of your anointing, your love, and your mercy. I ask that you will take charge of them and help them. Help them to become yours even more. I pray that there will be this anointing. People, there is going to be a shift. There is going to be a shift in the next few minutes. Now I want you to get ready for that. The Holy Spirit has just been informing me just now. He says that I'm going to shift not only just the environment, I'm going to shift the atmosphere, I'm going to shift their hearts as well. I'm going to shift your paradigm, says the Holy Spirit. And so wherever, you, whatever you're going through at this moment, whatever you feel, there is going to be a shift. There is going to be a transformation. There is going to be a mighty release that is going to happen. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you, 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 Lord. We worship you and we exalt your holy name. Let that, let that anointing flow, 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 flow right now and impact people. Impact them, impact them, impact them, impact them, change and transform them. I'm releasing this anointing right now. An anointing of holy intimacy with the Holy Spirit. It's coming now. It's here. It's here. Receive. Hallelujah. Oh. oh, Jesus, 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 Spirit of my Father. Mm. Touch their life, touch their lives, touch their lives, touch them. There's this shift happening, there's this shift happening. There's this shift happening, a shift, a shift coming in right now, right now, right now, right now. Feel that power, feel that anointing, feel that flow. Mm. Yes, 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 that holy flow. Oh. Any one of you, you feel 
that you just need to stand up, you can do that. You feel that you want to bow down, you can do that. You want to come forward, come forward. Come on, just allow the anointing. Let's just allow the flow. Yes, that flow, that flow, that flow, that flow. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. That anointing flowing, that anointing. That flow, that flow, that flow, that flow, that glory, that anointing, that flow. That precious flow, it's so awesome, it is so powerful, it is so you, Lord. I bless you, my Father. And I know that even at this moment, people are being healed. People, they're being delivered. There is a shift, there is a change that is happening in the hearts of many. Those who thought differently are now in sync with your thoughts. They are in sync with your ways. They're beginning to understand your holy ways. They're beginning to understand what it means to trust in you, to believe in you, Father. Hallelujah, Lord. The Lord is just saying to me right now to just speak to somebody here. I don't know how many of you feel this, but you feel that you know, religiously or spiritually or theologically, you're better than others. Somehow we tend to have this superiority complex when we look at other Christians. Or we, when we look at people, maybe in our workplace, or maybe in our neighborhood, or even our own cousins, our relatives, and we tend to have this almost spiritual arrogance in us, where we feel that we are better, that we are wiser, that we are smarter, that we are more um, correct, that's the word. And the Holy Spirit is saying, that hurts me. Jesus is saying right now, that hurts me more than anything else. He said, when you were born again, it was never with a spirit of competition or contest. It was never to make you better than others. It was so that you would be the best representative of my love, my compassion, my sensitivity, my patience for others. No matter how sinful, how wrong, how heartless they may have been, my son, my daughter, don't judge them. I am still on my throne of grace and I want you to release grace over them. So right now, the Holy Spirit wants me to just lead you in prayer. I mean, not as in me saying words of prayer and you're following, no, but just for us to come together and pray together whether loudly or softly. But let's pray for those who we think are less than us spiritually. Who we have judged others to be not as good as us. Come on. Come on. If you've judged anybody, if you have, in fact, it is a misjudgment. It is not a correct judgment, it is misjudgment. If you've looked at friends who are not from our denomination or from, not from our bends of theology or of teaching and you think that they are wrong and, then, and that we are right, can we just repent? And can we just ask the Lord to help us to live a better life of testimony in front of them? Can we do that? Because that's going to bring a shift so if you are here and you've judged others or misjudged them, then come on. I want us to go together in prayer. And as we're praying that, you know what? I will not be praying for the sick. I will not be praying for deliverance. I will not be praying for provision. But when we pray that prayer of repentance for misjudging fellow believers in the universe, in the world of belief, 
all that we need shall be provided for us. Come on. So if you're ready, can you please stand to your feet? And I want you to be sincere. Maybe you, you might not feel like you want to pray this loudly. But even if you do it softly or in the depths of your heart, but the Lord will hear you. But ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. So I would request all of us to just stand up and just lift our hands in repentance to God. Come on, let's pray and let's ask the Lord to help us to have a shift in our heart so we can be better instead of bitter. That we can be people who will be just in our commitment instead of being misjudged or misjudging others. Can we do this? Hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's just pray together. Hallelujah, Father. Forgive me for thinking that I'm better than others. Forgive me, Father, for misjudging your people, for misjudging the hearts of those who tries to come and worship you in their own way, in their own leading, under their mandate, their own mantle, and their calling. I may not understand everything, but whatever they are doing, Lord, if I have to correct them, because I believe that they're misquoting you or misteaching your word or misaligning themselves from your ways, instead of judging and mocking them and scorning them and being abusive or being judgmental, teach me how to be a better witness. Teach me how to be a better witness. Yes, there may be time when I will have to share with them the true word. But let me do that with humility and with grace. So that even if I tell them what is not right, that I would do it with a sincere heart. That I may say it with a heart of love and of patience. I love you, Lord. I bless you. Holy Spirit, shift my heart. Change the way my spirit has been judging others. Forgive me. I have not represented you, Lord, in a way that you want me. And I ask that you would forgive me. And even those who have walked away from us, even those who have judged us and misjudged us, Lord, may I learn to have a forgiving spirit, a spirit that says that we all need to be corrected on the other side of heaven while we're here, that we need to be better instead of being bitter. Oh, Father, teach me your ways. Holy Spirit, help me. Help me. To live a code of honor, your honor, that I will represent you with respect and with honor. Others, well, they may be wrong in the way that they do things, they may be wrong in the way that they accuse or threaten us or mock us, but Lord, let us not join in the chorus. Let us instead be patient. Let us instead be kind and gentle and with humility and meekness, May we shine the Christ-like life to others. I do not have to be like the world, like the spirit of religion. And I do not have to be arrogant because you are not. Instead, let me live the life of the one who is a beloved in Jesus. Loving and blessing people, not for who they are, but because of who you are to me, my dad. Because you forgive me, and you still love me, may I also learn to forgive, and may I also learn to love. May I learn to say yes to you. May I learn to believe in your ways. I have judged and I've hurt and offended many. 
And I ask for your forgiveness. I repent of anything that is not from you. I repent. Anything that is not from you, Jesus, I reject. Anything that is not in your heart, Holy Spirit, should not be in my heart. Jesus, forgive us. Correct us. Shift our heart. Make us whole. Bless us and use us. Change and transform us. That anointing will flow. The anointing that changes. The anointing that blesses. The, the anointing that should challenge us every time. So that we can be better. So that we can be holy. So that we can be like you. Like you, Jesus. Like you, Lord, always. Thank you, my Savior. I bless and I love you. Thank you for the healing, this deliverance, the provision, the breakthrough, the turnaround. And thank you for favor that is resting in us. We are yours. We love you. We adore you. You deserve our highest praise always. To the one and only Jesus be all of the glory. Hallelujah! Amen.